I have been waiting literal months for this whole thing. This is the expert of all expert fantasy baseball drafts. It is the 2024 Roto World Fantasy Baseball Mock Draft. Ahmed Farid, Eric Samolsky from Roto World. I am just an observer. I am facilitating a conversation. Eric, you have dual responsibility of also doing that and picking a team. I do. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of drafting one hand tied behind my back, but, um, you know, I'm excited to, to get into this. I'm excited to, you know, to do the draft and to hear the thoughts of, of a really talented group of drafters that we have with us. Um, this will be a 12 team draft. Um, so I'll give you the draft order, which will also let you know who's going to be drafting with us. Um, so I am leading off with the first pick. Um, and then I know it's, it is a terrible burden. How'd that happen? Um, <laughs> and we will, we will talk about that. Um, but, you know, I think, listen, DJ did this last year and got the 12th pick. So maybe they just kind of like flipped it to the front. Who knows? Um, Welcome to the second, team. second pick will be George Bissell, who is also here with us at Roto World. Uh, third pick will be DJ Short, who's also here with us. Um, fourth pick will be uh, Jen Piacenti uh, with Sports Illustrated. Fifth pick will be Andy Barons with Yahoo. Sixth pick is our own Connor Rogers, NBC Sports. Seventh pick. Uh, is Matthew Poliot, um, who's here with us at Roto World. Uh, eighth pick is my podcast partner, Scott Pianowski, who's at Yahoo. Ninth pick, uh, Howard Bender from Fantasy Alarm. Tenth pick, Sarah Sanchez with Bleed Cubby Blue. Um, Eleventh pick, NBC Sports' very own Roto Pat. Um, and twelfth uh, pick, last, uh, Dave Chauvin, who's also here at Roto World. Um, so that, that those are experts right there, Eric. You included yeah. in one of those. And so let's run through the format here real quick. You mentioned it, 12 team, five by five. The rosters mm -hmm. is it pretty standard here. Yeah, the only difference is we are not doing middle infield and corner infield. Um, and there's only three outfield spots as opposed to five. So you'll probably see slightly different strategies at the top of the draft because we have three or four fewer hitters in our starting lineup than you might find in, in other formats. Okay. All right. I heard a noise in my ear, and that means you the did. draft is about to begin here. Uh, means, I am uh, on with you here. So I'm sure Andy Barons, who's with us, has already informed us of what we should do and what if we do this. We're not going to have a good team. So so you have the first pick here, Eric, and let's talk about the first pick. It's, it's basically the easiest first pick that we've had in a while. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, last year, Ronald Acuna Jr. way outproduced everybody after him um, by almost double the amount um, he, you know, put up record breaking seasons in terms of the amount of stolen bases and home runs. He might not steal as many with the meniscus injury that he is kind of battling, but the Braves say he's all clear. He's going to start opening day. He is far and away the best player in fantasy this year. Um, and in most cases, having the first pick is the best spot to be in because he is so much better than everybody else that it is worth, um, you know, waiting uh, to come around back after the end of the second and third. So I'm not even really going to think about this here. Um, so there it is. Ronald Lacuna goes number Ronald one. And you, you see we welcome in there uh, Scott Pianowski and Connor Rogers. So, Scott, your your podcast partner gives himself the first pick. Are you going to revolt? Are you going to quit right now? Or? <laughs> yeah, we're all envious. As Eric said, it, it's a year <laughs> where it's an auto pick at one. And remember also, Acuna bets first. So you're getting maximum volume. And you like to get those early offensive players tied to explosive offenses like the Dodgers, like the Braves, the two best teams in baseball on paper right now. So you're not just getting a player who can do anything, but he's going to do more of it. He's going to bat lead off for a team that's going to cycle through the order over and over again. I, I I go to a draft. One of my priorities is to you know, identify, just like in fantasy football, who are the four or five best teams? Let's pick a lot of their players. You know, real simple, right? And so Eric's already done that at the top, taking the leadoff hitter on probably the best offense in baseball. Or at All right, most so Connor, two. Connor, we'll get we'll get to you here in a, in a second. You got the number six pick, so you're thinking about who you're going to take in the first round here. We've got Corbin Carroll three, but Spencer Strider, Eric two, a pitcher off the board at number two. Yeah, um, actually, I, we need to talk about Corbin Carroll three as well. But Scott and I, you know, we just finished um, our pitcher podcast uh, last week. And we both, you know, talked about the value of getting an anchor starting pitcher early, but we felt really confident um, in not having to draft the starting pitching super early. For me, I would not be taking Strider at two. Um, obviously, with the Garrett Cole injury, he is without a doubt the clear number one starting pitcher. I just feel like I'd rather get hitters at the top. I think it's really important to get guys who contribute in five categories. Um, especially in a, in a you know in this new landscape with stolen bases being so important, 
Um, but I'm curious, Scott, if if you kind of agree after our chat that maybe well, this is a little high. Hold Sorry, on real I'm quick. Right. Before, Scott, you, you answer. Connor, you're on the clock right now. What are you thinking? This is too easy, and I'm kind of shocked Mookie Betts is still there. I mean, I wasn't expecting this. There's so much to love here besides the obvious of him being an MVP candidate, the power. Um, but the fact that he has position versatility in fantasy, second base, shortstop, and outfield right now, I thought it would be a lot harder of a decision for me. I figured I'd be picking between Freeman, Tatis, and I'd even consider Soto. So I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled I got Mookie Betts there. I think that's great value. All right, so so Scott, you can comment on all this while you await your pick, which is now one away here on deck. Sure. Uh, it, it's important to note the settings in this league have a, a higher pitcher to hitter ratio. So maybe that will force some people to prioritize pitching more than they normally would. But Strider will be a first round pick in any draft mm -hmm. because of the high strikeout upside. And because now with Cole, if he it just separates him more from the rest of the pack. I'd be more comfortable taking Strider in the maybe the second half of a first round, but he certainly belongs there. And I, and I agree with what Connor said. One of the things I love is when a player does everything well, and Mookie Betts not only does everything well on offense, but he can play anywhere. The I mean, he may catch at some point before his career is over. That's how versatile <laughs> this guy is. He's an unbelievable bowler. Uh, and so to cover three positions, I talked about the importance of getting elite players on elite offenses. I think Connor's done really well at the sixth pick with Mookie. All right, so Shohei Otane, the uh... – the DH, who will get probably more at-bats this year that he doesn't have to worry about that pitching thing, goes right before you, Scott. So what are you thinking here? Yeah, again, you know, I want to take an elite player. I Everybody in the first round has ceiling, but I also want floor. And I ask you, have you ever regretted rostering Freddie Freeman? I mean, the guy hits 300-plus in his sleep. He's a good bet to lead the National League in runs scored. He even has stolen bases the last couple of years. I don't know that that's something I can bank on going forward, but you know, at least do, he won't be a zero in the stolen base category. Kyle mm -hmm. Tucker would also make a lot of sense here, but I don't think first base is as deep as it usually is. And again, I the Braves and Dodgers, man, I want a piece of those offenses. So I'm going to grab Freddie Freeman. Freddie Freeman off the board at eight to Scott Pianowski. So Eric, you mentioned Corbin Carroll. You wanted to talk about him. He went off the board, DJ Short. Your boss, yeah. technically, at three. Are you going to just rag on his pick here? No, DJ never gets anything wrong, um, and it was just <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, no, I mean, listen, I mean, when Scott and I did the outfield rankings, we differed a little bit on, on Carroll. My concern is with the shoulder. Um, he had shoulder surgery when he was in the minor leagues last season. Um, in two separate instances, he swung and immediately grabbed at his shoulder in pain. Um, they... Clear. I mean, they cleared him of any major injuries, but he didn't get any sort of cleanup procedure in the offseason. Um, so whatever was has been battling, whatever he's been battling in his shoulder since the surgeries that led to the flare-ups last year, um, that's still there, which means there is still potential injury risk. I feel like just slightly more um, injury risk for Carroll than guys like Julio Rodriguez, Bobby Witt, you know, Mookie Betts, who don't have that track record of an, an injury they are currently nursing um, being something that that is kind of like on their yeah. their record. And, and speed is such a huge part of his game. So if you have a shoulder injury, that really does impact um, sliding, in particular sliding head first. How often is he going to run? Um, so they're just things like that where I think he's a first round pick. I just think there's a little more risk to him than some of the guys that went after him. Upside versus risk, Scott, as you look at some of the guys who've gone here outside of Carroll, you got Julio Rodriguez, stud, young, uh, coming into his own, Bobby Witt, stud, uh, Fernando Tatis, a little risk, but a huge upside there. What do you think of uh, where those guys landed? Yeah, let, let me focus on the last pick of the first round, which was Trey Turner. I, mm -hmm. I think it's a great pick for Dave on, on the turn. Turner changed teams last year, signed the big contract, went to Philadelphia, and it's very common for players to struggle in that setup. Maybe they mm -hmm. press with the new deal or you know, do you get any new schools for your kids? You live in a new house, all that stuff. But Trey Turner was a first round producer in the second half. Obviously the Phillies are another lineup we want to invest in. He's Turner's been available in some Yahoo leagues in the second round, which I think is an absolute steal. I was hoping somehow he might percolate to me, which didn't happen, but I think he belongs in the first round. And I think here, here at pick 12 makes a lot of sense. So now that you have a first baseman there, another first baseman has gone off the board in Matt Olson, Jose Ramirez off the board there to Patrick Darty. So on the clock is Sarah Sancho from Bleed Cubby Blue and Baseball HQ. And Connor, this is always the hard part of doing a live draft and you being on it. You don't want to give away what you're going to do because someone will snipe you. Right. But 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 what's going through your head here? You got Mookie Betts. So you have like options here because you mentioned at the 
positional flexibility of Mookie Betts. And that's why I was so excited to get him, because I always find myself in any fantasy baseball draft, the second round, you start to creep in of what if I don't take a pitcher here? What if I don't take, depending on the year? I mean, we've talked about shallow positions in the <clears> past. I, I, right now, I could truly go BPA because I could slide Mookie around uh, between second, short, and the outfield. Most likely, he'll be playing an infield spot for me. And of course, you know, the pitching becomes really interesting, especially when a guy at the top and Garrett Cole is now going to be off the table in this draft as we kind of await the MRI news with him. All right. So as Connor contemplates his pick and sees how it all develops here, Eric, what about Bryce Harper and Aaron Judge? Two huge names going off back to back. Yeah, I mean, Aaron Judge is another one right now with with some injury concerns. I mean, he very clearly winced during a swing over the weekend. Um, the Yankees sent him for imaging. As of right now, they claim it's nothing serious. He says he'll be ready for opening day, but he's not going to swing a bat for the rest of the week. Um, the Yankees have said he's mid-spring beat up. Um, we already know he's going to have to manage his toe all year long. Um, I don't love a player that size who now kind of has to play every day in center field being mid spring beat up with two injuries um, on March 12th. That doesn't exactly give me a lot of confidence. He can make it through the whole season, but obviously, you know, even if you get 120 games out of Aaron judge, he's going to put up really good offensive numbers. So it's not a full fade for me, but there is some question. Um, and I, lo I love Bryce Harper and I love him at first base because you're going to get, um, steals out of the first base spot, which is so rare. I think you're going to get more steals than you saw last year because remember the first half of the year, he's coming off Tommy John surgery. So I really don't think he was running early in the season as much as he will when he's healthy. Um, so I love the Bryce Harper pick. All right, Connor, you're on the clock here. Are you pleased? I'm a little disappointed, not going to lie. I was hoping Harper or Alvarez, one of the two, would slide there. I, I guess I would have been surprised. And everything Eric said about Harper, uh, I've been in on this offseason. I mean, the fact that you have a first baseman that has a unique profile offensively, I think he's going to get back to being a 35 home run player. So I would have loved to have him. Uh, but in this spot, I'm okay with starting to look at pitching here and taking Corbin Burns, right? I mean, he has the offense to back him up in the wins. Uh, you look at some of the metrics from last year, it feels like he's bound to bounce back to being an elite pitcher again. Obviously, this is a guy playing for a lot. I think he'll be really happy where he is, which I don't know if you could say that after what happened last year in Milwaukee. So I'll take Corbin Burns and feel good about the top of my rotation. Scott, what do you think about the pitching and how it's fallen so far? Yeah, I love the Burns pick. Remember, Baltimore's a pitching park now since they've mm -hmm. made the dimension That's change true. a couple of years ago, and they've stalked him with so much talent around him. I thought hard about Burns. I just it was hard to pass on Austin Riley. I talked yeah. about how much I want to invest in those best offenses. I'm also jealous that Connor, when he gets Mookie Betts in the first round, and he talked about this a little bit. He's positionless now in offense. He can just take BPA and not worry about where the positions fit because you can play Mookie at three different spots and you know not easy to fill spots at that sometimes in the middle infield. So you know, we're chasing. I think a lot of times you're chasing the stats in the early rounds, and then you worry about the positions in round four, round round five, round six. What does my team look like? Maybe I don't want to take another first baseman if I already have one. Stuff like that. But that's the advantage you get from Mookie. We're going to see a pitching run start. I think yeah. probably in the third round. All right, Eric, you are back on the clock here, back-to-back -back picks, so we go into your brain as you think this out. Yeah, um, I was going to go with Pete Alonso because um, having Otani, I don't really – oh, sorry, not having Otani. Uh, having Acuna, I was looking at yeah. the Otani pick before, but having Acuna, I don't really have to worry about the fact that Alonso doesn't steal bases, and I, I get that elite power. Um so I, I'm going to pivot. Um, Scott mentioned taking guys from really good offenses. Um, right now, you know, I see Albies and I see Marcus Simeon. Um, I already have Acuna. I love uh, the plate appearances I get from Marcus Simeon. I love him hitting at the top of the lineup. I tend to think that we undervalue runs as a category. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to lock in Simeon here. Um, and then... I normally would not um, be taking a starting pitcher this early. Um, I'm content in most formats to wait to see who falls to like, you know, me at the end of the fourth round. However, uh, given the Garrett Cole injury and given, as we talked about, I need fewer hitters in this format than I would need in like, say, an NFBC format. Um, I'm comfortable locking in my ace here at the top um and then i might wait on starting pitching for a while um and so for me that's going to be zach wheeler um mm. who i have right after corbin burns 
Um, I, I love what Wheeler gives me on a really good team. Um, I think there's really consistent production from him. I love that he's messing around with the new splitter, just anything to kind of like increase the, the diversity of his arsenal against pitchers. Um, I don't think pitchers are naturally safe, but I think if anybody is safe fish, uh, it's Zach Wheeler. Let me jump in on the Simeon pick. Okay. He went right after Ellie De La Cruz, who may be the most polarizing player in fantasy baseball right now. He's the fastest guy in the league, right? But he's got holes in his swing. He hit 191 in the second half. And then Eric takes Marcus Simeon, who wants to play every game, who he's done it pretty much like four or five years in a row. A lot of people out there are going to be faced with like a Simeon De La Cruz decision. I will take Marcus Simeon a hundred times out of a hundred. So, Connor, you're on the clock here. I'll uh, get into your brain, then I got that follow up question for you, too, here. So, what are you thinking here, Connor? Uh, this is a tricky spot for sure. And once again, going back to the, you know, I think best hitter available approach here, because I got Burns in the second round and I didn't really plan on addressing pitching early. I just liked uh, the value of that spot here. So, a little torn in this area, but oh, man, I think I'm actually going to do a little bit of a surprise pick here and go with the Dallas Garcia because mm. I just want more power. I thought about Lindor who with the Mets has been a really slow starter, but the second halves he's had uh, can carry you when you get to the postseason for sure. And he was a guy that took advantage of the base running rules last year where you can expect 25 steals out of him, but I want more power in the outfield before a lot of that dries up. Like I said, I was on Alvarez in the last round didn't get him. So with Garcia, I pr feel pretty confident that I'm getting 30 plus home runs out of an outfielder. So this has been a, a little bit of an unpleasant experience so far for you, Connor. Is that what you're saying? Mookie at, for, at the first round. Connor, nothing well, can, yeah, yeah, nothing right. can kill my mood now. Yeah, nothing <laughs> can kill my mood now. But uh, I got I got to work a little harder now for this for third and fourth round for sure. So Connor mentioned he's looking at Lindor. Uh, Eric, you see there as a Scott. Oh, let's go to Scott. Scott, you're on the clock here. Garcia's off the board. Vlad's off the board. What are you looking at? Well, because I went power early, I, I was thinking about a pitcher, but that's like, you know, I went power early with Freeman and Riley. Freeman might steal 15 bases. Riley might steal 7 to 10. But I think this player has to have stolen bases as part of his game. Now, Michael Harris, I talked about I want to draft Braves and Dodgers. Simple, right? Michael Harris has been a star player buried in the bottom of a really good lineup. This year he moves up. It's his year three season. He's still in his young twenties. He hasn't had, he's I want players on the escalator. I want players with the arrow pointed up and he's not going to steal 50 bases, but he's going to steal 20, maybe 30. I think getting Michael Harris in the third round to anybody out there, I, I, he's somebody I want you to target. I want to leave a lot of drafts with Michael Harris and I'm going to grab him right now. Okay, so Michael Harris off the board. A lot of outfielders you see there. The teams coming up also have taken some of the elite outfielders off the board. Eric, I want to go back to earlier in this round. You got a couple shortstops right next to each other and a couple mm -hmm. second basemen with Altuve and Ozzy Alves and then Corey Seager and Bo Bichette. What do you make of uh, those guys going next to each other and maybe which one do you, do you like a little bit more or less? Yeah, I mean, I was between Simeon and, and Albies for my pick, so I, I love getting Albies there again. You know, we talked about the value in that lineup. I love Scott's Michael Harris pick, um, so that all makes sense to me. The Seager pick is, is I think, really good value. Um, Seager was going higher than this before um, the injury in spring. He may miss opening day, but he's tracking now to be back pretty close to opening day. There was some thought that he might miss more time um but he's you know the latest updates are that he's already getting in work and getting in swings and you know they might not not push him for opening day but he's going to be pretty healthy um he's not going to give you much speed but again george has ellie de la cruz and one thing ellie de la cruz will give you is speed um so i do like getting the power and batting average from seager and boba you know I, I wrote about him earlier in the year i don't think we're going to get the power we're used to seeing from boba um Pitchers are throwing him low and away far more often than before, and he's such a good hitter. He just takes it to right field, rocks a 300 batting average, and has no problem with that whatsoever. But the declining power and the declining speed um, has me a little bit down on him. I would probably be taking Lindor over Bichette. I don't mind taking Bichette at all, but I like that Lindor is going to help me in more categories. Is it funny how Bichette and Guerrero were the hot new kids, and now they hit a little bit of a plateau in their mid-20s, and I'm really not sure how to value them this year. It's And that team is tough. That team underperformed last year. How good is that lineup? They were like the young upstarts, and now we don't know if maybe they've they've all hit 
their ceiling or they've all kind of like reached who they are. Um, but again, I think Vlad and Bichette are both good picks. They might not no longer be the like, you know, alluring, uh, could they be first rounders, but they're both really good picks. Scott, what do you think here? We've got uh, Rosarena off the board, Machado, Luis Castillo. Pitchers go back to back, and Tarek Skubal. I'm a Detroit Tiger fan, so I hope he lives up to that value right there. I don't know. Gunnar Henderson, uh, young stud at third for the Orioles, George Kirby. So some pitching, some interesting pitching going off the board here. Well, up you know, you. Not, we, we've done all these shows together, and I didn't know. I live in Michigan, grew up in New England, but I've adopted all the Detroit teams. and. I think the Tigers can steal the division. I won't be on when, when Riley Green is drafted, but I want you to draft him. I want you to draft Scooble on as many teams as you can. Minnesota's the only team probably projected to have a winning record in that division. So, yeah, go get some Tigers. Go get some Scooble for sure. Get some Riley Green and go Detroit. You can follow in the footsteps of the Lions and, and maybe win 85 games. Win I mean, I knew I, I – Scott, I knew I liked you already. You know, it's just the love is growing here. There we go. Well – uh, early on, right, I was drafting from the strong teams, drafting from the strong teams. I'm going to draft a player from a weak team. C.J. Abrams, part of that big Soto trade for the Nationals, he percolated the top of the lineup last year and just ran as much as he wanted. He's projected for 36 steals. That's not enough. He's going to steal 50 or 60 bases this year. He was a great leadoff hitter for them the last quarter of the season, and I was a little weak in stolen bases. And Abrams isn't a zero in the power categories. He might hit 15 to 20 home runs. Yeah, Washington's not that good, but C.J. Abrams makes a lot of sense in the fourth round. Mm -hmm. So C.J. Abrams is off the board, another shortstop eligible player. Uh, Connor, you're coming up here. You are on deck coming off the power bat of Garcia. You got Corbin Burns pitcher. So you've got a pretty well-balanced team so far. What are you thinking right now? Really wanted speed. Would have loved Abrams. Uh, you know, had him <laughs> last year in my main league as a free agent pickup, which is remarkable when you think about it now, what he was able to do in the second half of the year. Uh, so this is once again, kind of go back to the well of, I could take BPA because I'm not, you know, kind of like you highlighted Ahmed is that I'm not really desperate anywhere. Mm -hmm. But it does feel like, and I would love to know uh, in a second, you know, Eric and Scott's thoughts on this. This feels like the part of the draft where it starts to round out a little bit. I don't see multiple players that I go, okay, that guy represents mm -hmm. a different value at 43. I see a giant pool of players here really starting to even out. Yeah, I, I fully agree with Connor there. And that that's why this kind of like top to middle of the fourth round, depending on where I'm drafting, is is where I'm okay getting my first starting pitcher. Right. Um, I look at the starting pitchers currently on the board, and I look at the starting pitchers who just went at the beginning of this round, um, and I'm happy to have those guys as my ace in a 12-team in a league, and I feel a little bit... Um, I still like some of the hitters here, but I feel a little bit less sure, and if I, you know, loaded up on three really good bats and had one of these arms, then I, you know, I feel great about it. Yeah, and I'm going to go pitching heavy here. So I'll have Corbin Burns and Zach Gallen in the same rotation, and I can kind of start to lean back into the lineup after this. And it, it was kind of a coin flip here. Glasnow was interesting to me. Of course, Freed in the contract year was really interesting to me. Uh, I'm not, I don't think Arizona was any fluke last year, though. So I believe in them supporting Gallen, and Gallen in himself is just a really, really good pitcher. Connor, any final thoughts? Your your uh, time with us is about over here. On any anything you'd like to share, wisdom. Let me say this: I've been in the same main league, and it's guys all across the country that have moved around for nine years. Last year was the first year I ever won it, and I'm going to give this exercise and listening to Scott talk for every <laughs> position group about 98% of the credit. So I was go. not going to pass up this opportunity. Uh, let's hope there's no championship hangover, and I appreciate you guys letting me in on the fun. Scott, you get half the winnings, I think, technically. Yes, I, think I, owe, I owe Scott at least a pint at a minimum. I think legally. Hey, just, just, you know, get me the championship DVD and one of those hats with the tag <laughs> still on it and a little confetti. I'm happy. But uh, always great to talk baseball with you. Go back and listen to the podcast that Eric and I have done. Yes. We've gone through every position. And you look at this round, right? Scooble, Kirby, Yamamoto, Gallon. Spend a lot of time figuring out how you feel about starting pitcher or say seven to like 15 or 16, because there's a good chance you might be drafting two of those guys. I think it's a very important pocket of the draft to get right this season. All right. So while Eric contemplates his pick, Scott Pianowski, Yahoo sports, you can hear him on the, the podcast with Eric Connor Rogers. You hear him on everything. It's NFL draft season two right now. He is crushing it in that world as well. Connor, uh, Scott, good luck the rest of the way here. You'll be with us, but not uh, on the broadcast, but, uh, but uh, thanks for sharing some time with us, guys. Thanks, thanks guys. Thanks. All right. So 
Eric, it is you. We will welcome in our, our next drafters here in a second. But talk us through what you're thinking here. Yeah, so um, I think I have a pretty good feel on, on one of my picks. The, the question here is, am I getting um, speed or not? And am I locking up all of my middle infield spots or not? Because... Um, you know, we not, don't have a middle infield category, so if I draft a shortstop, uh, that's it for me. I'll take the first guy. Um, I think people are too down on Paul Goldschmidt. Um, I expect him to have a solid bounce back year here. There was nothing in the metrics that told me he shouldn't hit 25 home runs again. Um, you know, maybe push about a 280 batting average. Uh, so I, I really like him at the value. Um, and then, listen, I'm, I'm going to have a little fun because fantasy leagues are also meant to be fun. Um, this is a risky pick, but in a league of this format where we're drafting fewer hitters, I think more hitters will be available on the wire. Um, and I want to have myself uh, a share of Royce Lewis, uh, who I think has really exceptional upside if he stays healthy. The if he stays healthy part is huge because he has not really stayed healthy in his entire career. Um, so it's a really big gamble. But uh, again, like because I don't have a middle infield spot, there were some guys I really liked with like Matt McClain, Nico Horner, um, you know, Glaber Torres. But I have second base already filled. And when I draft a shortstop, then I'm done in the middle infield. Um, and so I, I'm opting to wait because I like some of the value at that position later on. All right, and then we got Mike Trout off the board, Tyler Glasnow, Logan Webb, and now Andy Barron's on the clock. While we wait for our next uh, guest pickers here, I want to tell you about this. Spring training is here. We all know that, right? So for those looking to get ahead on the upcoming MLB season, grab your Roto World Baseball Draft Guide loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, player profiles to ensure your draft is a success. Visit NBCSports.com slash draft guide. Use Baseball 24 to get 10% off at checkout. And just like that, we have Sarah Sanchez from Bleed Cubby Blue in Baseball HQ and Roto Pat, Pat Darty from Roto World. Hello. Welcome to the broadcast, you two. Hello. I did not realize Sarah was a Cubs fan. I do apologize for my choice of attire. No, I think uh, it's it great. I think very subtle. So, very, very subtle. <laughs> you know. uh, so. I'll, I'll forgive you just this one time. Thank you very yeah, much. Just, yeah, just we all time. get a lot of yeah. friendly rivalry. That's the dark just, secret yeah. of our rivalry. Yeah. <laughs> just this one time, but you do have to remove it, is what she's saying. So if, <laughs> if you have this on 10 minutes from now, she will not forgive you. That's right. That's right. Uh, so, so Sarah, let's start with you here, because your pick is coming up first here, just a couple of picks. What do you make of uh, of your team, what you have so far? Let me see what you got. you got. You got Juan Soto, Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, and then George Kirby. Yeah, I'm happy with my team so far. I really like the hitting that I was able to amass at the top. It's a, it's a little weird being at the end of a 12-team turn. They're just the guys you get. Don't always get those five-tool guys falling to you, or it's a little too early to take Trey Turner or Jose Ramirez. But I like how this has come together so far. I really like George Kirby as my ace. George Kirby is the ace here. And Roto Pat, as I... Look at your team here. Let's see. Fernando Tatis, round one. Jose Ramirez, Randy Rosarena. And then you got the young stud at Baltimore at third, Gunnar Henderson. Yeah, we were planning to get George Kirby as our ace. And uh, <laughs> we do not have that. And yeah, so not so have... friendly rivalry. I'm told it. Not so friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and as you mentioned, all four players you mentioned, none of them uh, throw the baseball. They're all out in the diamond. And uh, I just wanted one of Max Fried, Aaron Nola, and uh, Logan Gilbert to fall to me. Uh, Logan Gilbert just went to Mr. Matthew Poliot. Framber Valdez just went to Scott Pianowski. I am absolutely praying I can get Max or Nola. You know, just lock in some strikeouts, some cheap wins, maybe with Aaron Nola. Max Fried is all about the cheap win, uh, provided he stays healthy. And not actually cheap since he's on an amazing team and is very good himself. Uh, but I, I waited a little longer than I wanted to for a pitcher. But as Eric was hinting at, like, since there's not as many – um, offensive spots in this league. I feel like some people, I thought pitching, um, I, I thought I'm losing my train of thoughts. Now I'm on the clock here. And your guy, right. your so, guy, your guy fell to you though. So you, so did. Did. While you, so you got it. So while you think here and you make your pick, uh, Sarah, Nico Horner to you, explain that one. Yeah. I was a little bit worried about stolen bases just with my start. Soto and Harper aren't exactly huge steals dudes. They might run a little bit and Soto in a contract year probably will, but feeling pretty good about my power. I feel much better about my speed situation now with Nico on that team. 
Um, he's also a really strong batting average guy, and he hits towards the top of the order, so the run production should be strong. What I was trying to say is I thought people were going to get cute and maybe wait on hitting a little more. Um, and I was like, I'm going to gobble up as many elite hitters as I possibly can. And trying to get guys who with steals, like I, you can't punt steals anymore. And mm -hmm. I think it, last year's steals didn't increase as much as I thought they did. But now like the, the prototypes out there and that, yes, it is easier. Um, yes, the success rate um, is probably going to go even higher this year. I, I think the floodgates might really open this year. So I don't want anyone who's just a zero. Like Gunnar Henderson is not exactly – uh, going to be swiping bags for me, but even like eight to 10 steals, I would like to get out almost every position. And that's something that's in the back of my mind for all my offensive picks this year. All right. So Pat and Sarah, while you think of your next pick here, Eric, we saw our first reliever off the board, Josh Hader at the end of round five. Yeah, we actually, uh, the begin the middle of the round before we had Edwin oh, Diaz. Oh, Edwin Diaz. You're right. Too. You're right. It I was just, that. it was in the middle of that starting pitcher run. Um, and the color isn't, and it isn't diversified. Um, right. so, this is an interesting pick. Scott and I did our reliever podcast yesterday. Um, I have Hader as my fifth ranked closer. Um, the reason for that is he has publicly stated he doesn't like throwing more than one inning. Um, the Astros have another really good closer in Ryan Presley. I the I do not think the Astros would hesitate to bring Hader in in this eighth inning if the if the team's middle of the order hitters you know are heavily left handed. If you're getting you know. Albies and Olsen, if you're getting, you know, Freddie Freeman and, and Otani. Um, so I do think that there's a chance that we see Presley steal seven, eight, nine saves during the course of the year. And I, I think that makes Hader a good pick still. However, um, I have the closer that Sarah just took uh, higher than Josh Hader. I do too. And I was really happy he fell to me. <laughs> Johan Duran is my, one of my favorite closers this year. And I don't have a lot of him yet. He just hasn't fallen to me in drafts. And that's okay. That's how that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. But I really like having him in this draft. So Aaron Nola, Roto Pat, back-to-back -back yes. pitchers. You got I'm, your guys. I'm, I did. I'm feeling very good. Because in general, regardless of the year, I always like to stack hitting early. And even though there's so few 200 innings guys now, you can still get a lot of good 170, 180 innings guys later and I, I think pitching is always deeper than it gets credit for i want to try to get as many elite bats as possible early uh with the belief that people like nola uh is going are nola and uh whoever my other pitcher is i'm i'm uh, totally uh um, max free yeah, max free, max free. Yeah. guys will and freed will fall i was starting to quite literally sweat it um but they did yeah. but now with the four big bats the two I mean, they both have top five upside uh, maybe not aaron nola uh, i'm feeling lucky and extremely happy with my first six picks in early roster construction. Ayuri Perez for the uh, the Marlins came on last year, showed some really brilliant flashes. He goes here in the sixth round. Christian Yelich, O'Neill oh. Cruz goes to Matthew Pouliot, shortstop for Pittsburgh here in the middle of round six. Uh, Sarah, so if you could share, Sarah, like what are what is one tip that you could give? to people that are watching, going into a draft, what is your mindset this year that may be different than, than previous years or one thing that you're focusing on? Yeah, you know, the thing I've been thinking about, and it's really evident in this draft just because of where I'm picking and how my team is coming together, I am very much a choose-your-own-adventure type of drafter. Like, take what the draft board hands you and then figure it out as mm -hmm. you go. And so in this instance, the two best bats that came to me in rounds one and two happened to be Soto and Harper. And that's not how I normally start a team. I normally like to get a little bit of speed there looking for a five tool guy. I was really hoping Spencer Strider or Freddie Freeman would fall to me. They were nowhere close to falling to me. That's okay. Um, but then, you know, you have to mix and match a little bit. And so I like to be modular in my thinking. That meant I wasn't going to get, say, a Raphael Devers, or I wasn't going to get um, one of the third basemen I like the most. So I really wanted to prioritize getting Manny Machado, who I think is going to have a bounce back year after his injury. And I already explained why Nico Horner was a big part of that build. So really being flexible and playing around with the different things that come to you in a draft. Last three picks, O'Neill Cruz, Matt McClain. So a couple of young guys in the middle of the infield for some up and coming teams, Kyle Schwarber, the, uh, the power extravaganza and not much else goes mm -hmm. off the board to Andy Barons, who goes outfielder, outfielder back to back with Josh Lowe in the, the pick before that. So Eric, as you look at what's happened here over the last few picks, anything stand out to you? 
Yeah, I mean, I was hoping, foolishly hoping, that one of O'Neill Cruz or, or Matt McClain would fall to me. Um, I think we have dinged Matt McClain a little bit for the oblique injury he suffered in, in spring. Um, you know, he is fully healthy. I think what he did last year is not a fluke. Um, I love the five-category upside there. And we seem to have forgotten just how good O'Neill Cruz is. Um, and I would caution people about forgetting that because before Ellie De La Cruz was hitting rocket home runs, um, O'Neill Cruz was. And the injury last year was a fluke injury sliding into home, the fractured uh, ankle, or maybe it was a uh, fibula. I forget what it was, but it's, it is not a soft tissue injury. It's not a recurring type of injury. Um, so I, I am aggressively trying to get O'Neill Cruz uh, wherever I can. And so I think he's in for a really big year. I'm up here on the turn. Um, I really wanted Cole Reagans. Um, he went just the pick before me uh, to George Bissell. I have um, I try to get two starters within my top 20. Um, I am down towards the end of my top 20. However, I will happily take uh, Freddie Peralta um, to be my SP2. I really like what he did in the second half of last year. Um, I know he's not on one of the NL Central teams that we're supposed to be fans of in this section of the draft. Um, but I think that, you know, he was really good for the Brewers down the stretch. Um, I like he's um, I like his arsenal in general. I think the innings concerns are overblown. He was only he's only been a starter for three years. So I think people look at his overall innings totals and say that he's not really um, going to give you lots of innings. But he averages 165 innings as a starting pitcher. Um, and so I like that. And then, um, you know, I think I'm going to roll the dice on on some relievers later i wanted some speed in the uh in those middle infielders they went right before me um i'm gonna pivot to somebody that i think can help me in five categories and is on a, a slightly up-and-coming team and i'm gonna take brian reynolds um Ooh. as another outfielder never um, heard I, uh, the pirates I think, up and coming i think the pirates have i think the pirates i mean up and coming relatively speaking to the pittsburgh pirates i think they have some interesting young talent i think they're going to have two uh potential future aces joining their rotation by at least the middle of the season and so i think that this is a team moving in the right direction um and i like uh some of the young hitters to have some improvement this year uh and i just like getting a solid guy like brian reynolds who i think who i think gets overlooked this has been such an interesting stretch of the draft. You talk about Matt McClain, Eric. I do worry. I mean, I've never heard of like a um, like a oblique, like a recurring oblique injury. So Matt they said being, they I, said it wasn't. Like they said it, or yeah, they said it wasn't related to the first injury. He just yeah, I don't took, believe that. He took far too many swings on one day mm -hmm. and hurt his oblique. Um, and that is entirely possible if you are swinging and you're swinging too much to the point where you get tired, but you're, and your, you know, your swing mechanics start to break down a little bit, but you keep swinging through it. You can aggravate something. And I think in the spring we see teams get incredibly cautious with injuries because obviously you don't want anybody to play through anything where in the regular season players play through dings and bumps and bruises all the time. So I think that sometimes we overlook how long guys sit out in the spring. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm not this. He was not an injury prone player in the minor leagues throughout his career. So I'm trying not to overreact to two things that have happened recently and trying to kind of like create an injury prone narrative from that. And you, you mentioned Cole Reagan's I'm, I'm trying not to reach this year. So especially as I've become more of a football guy, you know, uh, I, I, when I'm, I'm baseball drafting, I find myself getting away from meat and potatoes drafting every year. Like I want like whatever, Young guys are just blowing up spring training. And Cole Reagans, of course, isn't just blowing up spring training. He blew up the league in the second mm -hmm. half of last season. And I see all, like, the next DeGrom hype for Tariq Skubal, who I also love. But Cole Reagans, I was like, man, this guy's, like, talk about the left-handed DeGrom. Cole Reagans, but the kind of including the injury history. He's got a very concerning injury history, but he's someone that I've been wanting on all my teams, and I was very sad I was not able to make him part of the squad here. Yeah, what what pitcher does not have the the injury concerns? Yeah. You're here, Garrett true. Cole going off going <laughs> off in the in the seventh round. So Sarah, as it nears towards you, you just took your reliever last round. You got your speed with Nico Horner before that. What do you think of Garrett Cole going off here in the seventh I, round? I was wondering how far Garrett Cole was going to drop. I wasn't going to take him. I'm not taking a guy who I think could miss sure. the whole season as one of my top two pitchers. But I totally understand. That's incredible value if the MRI comes back. And it's just nothing to worry about. So I totally understand that pick. I was not going to do it. 
Yeah. All right. So I'm Lane Thomas, a, an outfielder, goes off the board here. It's hard to tell. It's, a lot of it depends on when you're drafting, right? And when the news comes out about Garrett Cole, it could be completely different here a week from now. So, Sarah, you're on deck here. Oh, you're on the clock. The third catcher has gone off the board here. We got Adley is gone. JT is gone this round. And now, Will, what are you thinking? Uh, interesting. I was going to take a different catcher who was still on the board. So I'm just going to do that. I know and who you're taking. Don't do it. I'm going to take William Contreras. That's a shame. Why is that? <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> is that, is was, that who you wanted to take? I mean, I he, has, he, is identical, he is identical <laughs> to his big brother, who is my favorite baseball player of all time, with one exception, and that is batting average. This is a batting average league. William Contreras is a 20 home run bat. He is one of the Brewers' best hitters, hits early in the lineup, and he hits 276 to 280. So here for it, and now I have a catcher. I right, know. So, so truly, Pat, yeah, you have the you have the opportunity. Two opportunities now to take someone who Sarah wants. So let's see if you can do it. <laughs> I, no one's gonna want to take who I think I'm gonna take because uh, I feel like he gets blown up every fourth relief appearance, and still somehow at the end of the year always has an ERA under three. But I'm dialed in on Rasiel Iglesias right now. Just don't want to do. It. I hate investing in closers early, but th this is the kind of year where I feel like even if you're not a football guy, I feel like after the top ten or eleven closers, like is this guy actually a closer. And like the closing stuff has gotten more fraught than ever. Uh, I hate having to worry about closer. I hate having to waste fab on closers. So I like to get at least one elite locked in closer. I feel like I saw Rocio Iglesias blow a few too many games against the Cardinals over the years in the <laughs> NL Central, uh, but he's an elite closer and I'm happy to have him on the team. Eric, what do you think about that pick? Yeah, no, I, I like it. Um, you know, I, I've been getting him in a lot of places when I wait out the like, you know, the top tier of guys like Edwin Diaz and, and Class A and, and Duran. Um, I think, again, you you really want closers. Well, you, you prefer to have closers on good teams, um, even though we've seen plenty of closers on bad teams rack up high save totals. But um, Iglesias has been just kind of a solid pitcher. I think you're always surprised when you look at his stats at the end of the year and you're like, oh, really? A sub three ERA? Okay, I didn't expect that. Um, but I, I think that that's kind of what you'll get is I never I never watch my closers just as a rule. Um, I can't do it for my heart and my anxiety and just because it always seems much worse than it is. So I, I like I like Iglesias. There are some other guys I'm I'm hoping uh you know make it back to me provided you know Sarah decides to go in another direction since she already has a closer. So you definitely don't need to take one right here, Sarah. <laughs> just just to let you know. Um so yeah I, I like kind of picking from the from the back half of the top 10 as my first closer is is my preferred path. Um obviously if somebody like Johan Duran falls to me I'm happy to to do that. But um I like loading up on hitters early and, and seeing sure. which closer I can snag. All right so Pat uh oh can you hear Pat? I mean Pat's on Pat. podcasts all the time and muted himself again. I'm sorry I was so sad like about missing out every on day. I was so sad about missing out on Trout 2.0, Wyatt Langford, oh. that I just muted myself so you couldn't hear me crying. I just got <laughs> sniped on that, so um, I'm going to go a different direction because I was about to take Wyatt I'm Langford. I'm about to make oh, my first – I'm timing out into my cue pick. I'm going to take Tristan Casas. I said yes, I don't you want, are. I'm going to say I yes, don't want someone who's are. a zero in any – and Tristan Casas only has one career stolen base. Yeah, he uh, will not steal bases. He's but not he going to steal any bases. He'll hit 25. He is very now. good. All right, so with the speed that Sarah picked right there, you wanted Wyatt, you said, Sarah, but you did not want Rysel or Tristan Casas, so you were good there. Pat did not get you. I, yeah, no, I already have my first baseman in Bryce Harper, and so I love Tristan Casas. I actually normally wait on first base until about this point in a draft because I really mm -hmm. like the first baseman who go here, but I've got Bryce Harper, so I didn't need to do that. Um I needed a middle infielder, either a second baseman or a shortstop. Nico is nice that way because he has dual eligibility, which allows me to just sort of pick the best second baseman or shortstop that comes to me in this point in the draft. And I thought Xander was a really nice boost for that batting average. And he's also, I mean, I, I was kind of stunned how much he ran last year. That was not really part of his game in Boston. I like the mm -hmm. fact that he might be a 2015 guy. So we'll go Xander. I was wondering if Xander was running a little more last year because he just wasn't hitting as much for a while, and he was like trying to find any way to contribute. Because so I thought that was strange too with Xander Bogarts last year. And the yeah, team totally. needed the team needed a little jump start offensively, um, but I think that would probably continue this year too. Without Soto, I think they'll look to manufacture a little bit. Um, and I think it's interesting you you pointed out he wasn't hitting as much. I think when you look at the line at the end of the year with the two eighty five average, you think you know, oh, he actually hit pretty well. You know, we see 
we see guys have a batting average dip when they leave Fenway because Fenway, you know, people think of home runs when they think of the green monster, but it really pumps up batting average. So I think Bogarts was always going to see a, a, a decline in average, but there's no reason he's not a 280, 290 hitter again. Um, and as Sarah pointed out, you're, you know, you're getting 15, 15, 15, 20, you know, 20, 20. I mean, there, all these things are within his range of outcomes in a lineup that's still better than people think it is. Well, speaking right. of, oh, sorry, 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 Ahmed. Um, no, no, no. I was just wondering. Go ahead, go ahead Pat. When we're speaking about Xander Bogart surprising stealing 19 bases last year, I was wondering, do you guys agree with my thesis that steals didn't increase quite as much as I expected last year? They did increase, of course, while the success rate stayed higher. Do you guys agree with me now that teams have seen it put into practice that it really is going to be easier to run? That there might be something of like explosions too strong, but a market increase even on last year. Or do we just think teams are still going to remain cautious? They don't want to give away outs on the base base paths, and there might not be another increase. No, I actually think that steals are going to go up again for a couple of reasons. One that you just said, which is that teams had a lot of success running last year, and I actually think the teams that over ex like exceeded our expectations, the Diamondbacks, the Reds, those were teams that were taking advantage of the new rules and really running riot on the base paths. I think that other teams will see that and try out their luck there as well. And I, if you look at sort of the shape of stolen bases, how you deal with that is as much a team philosophy as it is an individual player philosophy. And so as more teams jump on that bandwagon and realize, hey, I have Dansby Swanson on my team. He doesn't have a hurt heel this year. The Cubs are a team that likes to run. I think Dansby's going to steal 25 bags if he's healthy. Sarah Sanchez, Baseball HQ, Bleed Cubby Blue, had to watch Roto Pat wear that <laughs> Cardinals jersey the entire time, Roto Pat from Roto World. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for lending your expertise here. Uh, it went so fast, but we say goodbye. Good luck the rest of the way here. Same to you guys. Thank you much. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right, so Eric is mid-picking. Joe Musgrove is off the board now. You took him there, Eric, and you took uh, – Andres Munoz. So we'll get your commentary here in just a second, but let's first remind everyone that the Players' Championship is coming up. Scotty Scheffler, Rory McIlroy lead the world rankings, are included in one of the toughest fields of the season this weekend at TPC Sawgrass. You can catch the 50th edition of the Players' Championship Thursday through Sunday on NBC, also Golf Channel, with all rounds also streaming on Peacock. Eric, we'll get your analysis here in just a second. We welcome in two new friends, Howard Bender from Fantasy Alarm and Dave Chauvin from Roto World. Hello, man. How's How it going? You doing? How are you doing? Thanks for having me. All right, Howard, first we'll start with you. How do you think your team is looking so far? What my do you got? My team looks amazing. What are you talking about? <laughs> Come on. Everybody loves their team five picks in, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, listen, I think uh, you know I've got power. I've got speed. Um, you know, knowing that it's, you know, only nine hitters and seven pitchers that we're going with here um, in this format, then, you know, I knew I, you need to attack starting pitching. I've got great strikeout numbers here and, and you know, good solid ratios from, from Yamamoto, Grayson Rodriguez, Yuri Perez. I went back to office. I love it. I love it. What could possibly go wrong? Kyle Tucker, Aaron Judge, first two picks there for you, Howard. And then you got Francisco Lindor. Yeah, Yoshi Yamamoto, uh, picking him, obviously an unknown here, but what's your thought process and where to value him? Well, I mean, I, I value my talent from a talent standpoint. I mean, I think Yamamoto is easily a top five starting pitcher. I'll say this. If Yamamoto does not win Cy Young and Rookie of the Year, then not only do the Dodgers make a, a $325 million mistake, but so did the uh, the front offices of the three other teams that offered in excess of $300 million to get Yamamoto. I mean, everybody's in on this. Barring any kind of an injury, this guy should dominate, much in the way that we saw Shohei Otani uh, you know, dominate. We've seen uh, pitchers come over from Japan and pitch really well. Yes, we've seen some stink, but those that stink, did they make $320 million? No, probably not. <laughs> All right, so before we get to Dave, uh, Howard, you are on the clock here. Let's go through your brain while you think of who you're taking here. Oh, yeah, right on, right on. Well, I mean, I'm going to go back to the to the pitching format here. Everybody's going closer, closer crazy right now, so I might as well just jump into the fray with one of my absolute favorites. I love the fireballer, Alexis Diaz. He's going to be on a very competitive team. I'm not really as concerned with a with a, a closer about Great American Small Park as most people. 
Um, I love the talent. So if everybody, if everybody else is taking closers, I might as well not get left out in the cold. All right. So Dave, we'll, we'll take a look at your complete team here in a second, but you are on deck. So let's just think of uh, this pick right now and what you're looking at and what you think you still need to fill out here in round number nine. Yeah, pretty much most of my offense. I mean, I started with uh, Trey Turner and Matt Olson at the one, two turn. I got a nice blend of power and speed there. And then I just kind of hammered pitching for a while. Uh, Castillo, Tarek Skubal atop the rotation. I got a couple of closers already. I added Kevin Gossman, who's another 200 strikeout arm, as long as, you know, the shoulder holds up. And then I added Wyatt Lankford uh, to my offense, but that is it so far. So I need need some offense and I need some flexibility. And I think my first pick here is going to be ha Young Kim, who's going to give me both of those things. He covers second, third, and short. Kind of affords me some flexibility with the rest of the draft here. So I'm going to take that one. And then on it. This next one, I'm not really sure which direction I'm going to go yet. I got a couple of guys in mind I'm trying to weigh it out here. Don't think he's going to make it back to me here. So we're going to go Jaron Duran, uh, outfielder from the Red Sox. All right. So you go some hitting, some outfield to pair up with Wyatt Langford. And you don't, you didn't hear this, but Roto Pat was just on and Sarah Sanchez on as well. They were bummed that they could not get Wyatt Langford. Roto Pat called him <laughs> the next Mike Trout. And so for those that may not be familiar with Wyatt Langford, tell us uh, about him and, and, and why you took him there. I mean, I just think he's got a crazy high ceiling for a rookie. Uh, and, you know, we've seen Bobby Witt Jr., Julio Rodriguez, a lot of these guys kind of burst onto the scene uh, as soon as they st step into the big leagues. And I think Langford has the opportunity to do that this year. Uh, He's destroying the Cactus League right now. It's looking more and more likely that he's going to crack the opening day roster. And if he does, hitting in that Rangers lineup, which is kind of stacked top to bottom, I think he's, you know, a 2020 guy right off the bat with huge totals and runs in RBI. And he's got such good plate discipline that, you know, his batting average is going to be on the plus range also. I mean, he walked more than he struck out both in college and in his limited minor league sample. I just think the sky's the limit for him this year. Howard, adding to your steals in round 10. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely going to be something I heard you guys talking about it while I was uh, chilling in the green room, by the way, great job filling out my rider guys. I was very, very impressed that so many items made it in there. Um, I mean, Ruiz is a guy who, you know, he's just, he's a one trick pony. He's a, he's a steals guy. Um, I, I feel confident in the players that I have as far as batting average goes that he's not going to drag me down too much. This is a, you know, it's, it's an easy opportunity to dominate in a category. And then, you know, all of a sudden when you start looking at, you know, throughout the season, you're not as concerned about speed or you find that you do have speed to trade. And what we've all seen in Roto category, you know, Roto leagues throughout the years is that stolen bases is really one of the easiest categories to move up. So having that uh, that jump right there in the beginning to be able to look at that, you know, later on and, and be able to deal from a strength like that. Uh, and build up somewhere else that you need. I think it's uh, it's very valuable for uh, for utilizing that uh, in a fantasy season, a full long season. All right, so so Eric, I'll let you chime in on anything that you've seen here over the last couple rounds um, that stand out to you. Sure, I just wanted to talk about um, Andres Munoz is one of my favorite picks at closer, which is why I grabbed him here. Um, he tends to go later, so um, I'm happy to get him when he falls. Man, these picks are flying coming down to me right now. Um, Seattle uh, has a little bit of a committee, but they they trust him in the back end. Matt Brash is a little banged up, so I think that you'll see a lot of um, I think you'll see a lot of Andres Munoz at the end of of games. Um, I think he's just like really strong um and i'm talking as i'm picking um i was gonna go with uh dansby swanson who was falling much farther than i i thought um was gonna give me a little speed in the middle infield um but he just flew off the board um so i'm not gonna take that um i think given the categories that were we have right now um i see some first baseman that i like but i see some first baseman um still on the board later so let's do this we're gonna double dip i'm gonna finish up my outfield um with Seiya suzuki who um got really healthy after battling an oblique injury at the start of last year um and had a great end of the season he's always put up a really strong batted ball um, data and I think he hits the ball incredibly hard and so I think we're going to have a good season from him however that doesn't really get me speed so um, as much as <clears throat> my Red Sox fandom really 
prevents me from making this pick. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take Anthony Volpe here as my starting shortstop. Um, I think the power and speed is, is clear. I know he hit 209 last year. Um, he revamped his swing in the off season to go back to something that he was using a little bit more in the minor leagues. I still don't think I'm getting higher than like a 240 batting average from Volpe, but I think that could come with 20 home runs and 25 steals. Um, and in a, in a pretty good, team context obviously depending on Aaron Judge's health um and so I like getting Volpe here like around pick 120 um as a shortstop in this format um I'm happy to take him in a middle in as a middle infield spot in a deeper format as well um if I was going to wait if I needed to you know, get a shortstop early and then uh kind of sure. like pick a middle infield um earlier but I like Volpe's upside here all right, Howard, instant analysis on the last five picks we've seen here. Cattell Marte, Jackson Churio from the Brewers, young prospect, Craig Kimbrell, Sonny Gray, and Chris Bassett. Anything um, stand out to you? Well, I mean, obviously Jackson Churio is, is the exciting young rookie. He's going to start in center field for the Brewers right now. Um, he's giving you some speed that you want. I think he's got a great ceiling. He's a talented player. He is 19. It's going to be a you know a, a little bit of a of a struggle for him at times, I'm sure. Um, but I do think that the talent outweighs all of that, and I think he's got some good veterans around him uh, who can actually you know help him along with uh, with what's going on. He's also kind of coming up here with Sal Frelick, so the two of them are going to be able to kind of bond with each other. So I, I like that pick there. I think Sonny Gray is one of the more underrated guys. I know that mm -hmm. he's dealing with a hamstring issue right now. He's thrown from flat ground. They're looking to ramp him up. Uh, so everything profiles well. I, I like a good veteran guy like Sonny Gray. Gets you good strikeout numbers, but, you know, he's he's an innings guy. Uh, and, and you're definitely going to need that. And as I'm looking to, you know, make my next pick here, I'm going to look towards pitching. And I'm on the clock right now, so I might as well uh, just make it that live pick and see who I want. And uh, I guess I'm going to have to go to another – reliable underrated innings eater and that's uh merrill kelly i think kelly is a, a good solid guy to have on your staff he's not gonna you know do magical crazy things but he's never gonna hurt you so i think having that kind of stability after i've got the upside strikeouts with my first three pitchers i think merrill kelly makes sense all right dave let's go back to you you are on deck for your two picks in a row what are you thinking right now uh, well, we've seen a couple of reliable innings eater type starting pitchers go this round. Uh, I'm looking at a starting pitcher that's kind of the opposite of that. He's going to get me the strikeouts and he's going to be great when he's on the mound. Can he stay healthy? You know, we'll see. Uh, I think motivation playing for a contender on the Braves really going to lead Chris Sale to a big year. So I'm going to go with him hmm. first. And then with my other one here, I'm looking at the catching position. Uh, I know it's a one-catcher league, so there's only 12 of them that are going to be drafted. So I didn't take one as early as I normally do, uh, but this guy is the fifth name on my board at the position. I think he's in line for a huge year in the middle of the Astros lineup. We're going to go with Yiner Diaz. Yiner Diaz off the board. So, so Dave, you're at the end of the end of the draft here. Obviously, a couple of people have this situation every every draft. You're either at the top and got two back to back. You do get Ronald Acuna if you're in that spot. What what would be your advice to those out there who are at the end of the draft that those back to back picks like you do? Uh, I, I think the main thing you got to keep in mind is you're kind of at the mercy to runs at you know positions in the draft. Don't be afraid to go and get your guys and start a run because you know there's you know 24 picks before it gets back to you. I'd rather be ahead of it than taking, you know, what's left over at the end. So I'm not afraid to start a run. Eric, you like that? Yeah, advice? I was going to say, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier is like how to use ADP in a draft, right? And I think that ADP is not a, a ranking, right? It's not saying, oh, I'm going to take this guy here because that's where his ADP is. It's a, um, it's a little bit of a, a guide into how people tend to value that player. Um, and so if I look at a player and I want to draft him and I see his ADP is 50 picks later, then I could say, okay, maybe I'll wait one more round. Now, if you really like somebody, don't be afraid to jump the ADP in particular, if you're on the corner, like Dave and I are right. It's, you know, 24 picks until we get back to somebody. So if I really like somebody, there's nothing wrong with jumping his ADP by 30 picks because all it takes is somebody to jump the ADP by six picks and all of a sudden I lose that player. So it's important to use the ADP as a general guide of where a player is going. 
in particular, if you can filter the ADP by like the type of league that you're in, because it does vary pretty drastically. Um, but you know, it is, again, it is one resource in a draft, uh, and it's not the be all end all. And so what Dave's talking about is like, you got to make sure that you, if you want to start a run, if you don't want to miss out on somebody, if you're on the corners, you just got to, you know, grit your teeth and, and take that pick. Um, yeah. and you know, be okay with whatever comes from it. A little easier when you get the number one pick and you got the back-to-back -back picks there because you do get Ronald Acuna. And, guys, Eric did give himself that pick for this draft. And so um, what you can do when you're when you're co-hosting the entire thing, that's something that you can do. Uh, Howard, you took the, the – The ease of yeah. the performance of the rest of the show. You that's know right. I mean? That's true. I did you're it for, right. I did it for everybody. Show. I did it for everybody. <laughs> uh, Hunter Brown, Howard, uh, that seems like a huge potential upside but a wild card. Yeah, obviously a, a little bit of a wild card, but at this point right now, I've got the the ability to uh, to make that move. I've actually been a little bit more in on Hunter Brown than I've been in Christian Javier, which I think is uh, a reverse from what most people have when you're looking at the uh, the Houston starting pitchers. Um, I just want to double back and just say I, great points on ADP, using it as a guideline and not the gospel. I see that so many times, and I've been dealing with you know a lot of uh, you know just trend watching. And things like that, because if you're sitting there and you're going by ADP, not only do you not know the actual source, like, you know, I mean, what's the time frame? Like the mm -hmm. NFBC, that allows you to set a time frame with that. But if you get a guy who's like for two months has been drafted in the 15th round, and then all of a sudden in the last two weeks, people have been taking him in the 10th, his ADP is still going to be, a you know, skewed a bunch. So <clears throat> guys like Wyatt Langford, Jackson Churio, um, these guys are jumping up in the ADP uh, an incredible amount over these last couple of weeks. Right. So, you know, I agree with you, you know, get your guy, Estier Ruiz. I was in a, a draft last night where I, I was going to need speed and somebody jumped ADP by like three rounds to grab him. And I just, I looked and I was like, there it is. Lesson learned. I needed right. speed. I should have taken him with my last pick. Simple even, as that. Even somebody like Christian Encarnacion Strand, who went inside the top 100 in this draft because nobody knew how much playing time he was going to get. Well, with right. the suspension of Noel V. Marte, he seems locked into full-time playing time. So if your ADP is before that suspension, it's going to tell a very different picture than post-suspension, where Encarnacion Strand is likely to be a top 100 pick in most formats. Guys, that, that went too fast. Uh, four rounds have flown by here. Howard Bender, Fantasy Alarm, Dave Chauvin from our own Roto World. Thanks so much for sharing your insights with us, taking us into your brain while you picked. Um, and good luck, the, good luck the rest of the way, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, All guys. Right. We, we say goodbye to them. And while we wait for our next experts to join the chat here, I want to tell you to bet the edge. You already know how to do that. Get your day started with Bet the Edge. Jay Croucher, Drew Dinsick have all your betting needs covered from MLB, NBA, college hoops, and more. New episodes drop every weekday at 6 a.m. Eastern. Whether you're targeting spreads and totals, circling player props, or looking for value in futures markets, they have it all. Jay and Drew certainly do. As we continue right now at the end of round 12, Eric is picking away. We welcome in the one, the only, Andy Barons to the show here and DJ Short. Hello, man. How's it going? Good. And a, and a cameo appearance by Roto Pat, um, Andy <laughs> Shirt. <laughs> Am I, I, I can't be the only person who wore a Roto Pat shirt on this broadcast, right? Am so I, I have a Roto I, World I, shirt, but not a Roto Pat, unfortunately. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's in the wash. I bet Is Pat's it, wearing one. I bet I bet Pat walks around in Roto Pat shirts all the time. Cardinals <laughs> jersey. Cardinals jersey. Cardinals jersey today is what it was <laughs> with Sarah Sanchez, who's a who's a Cubs fan. So a little bit of a rivalry already in the league. Uh, guys, it's so good to see you. Uh, Eric just made his picks. We'll talk to him about it in just a second here. Uh, but Andy, let, take take us through what you've been able to do so far. Looks like you're about to be on the clock here once again. Are, are you pleased with it? What what was your strategy coming in? Have you been able to do that? So this is a this is a pretty typical draft for me. Um, I, I I mean I I usually load up on hitting early. Um, it is very rare for me to take pitching anywhere in the first. I don't know. I took a pitcher in the eighth round here, which is a little bit undisciplined for me. But I, I felt like Blake Snell fell a little bit a little bit farther than he needed to. Um, I, I'm I'm definitely normally somebody who builds that offense, and I've just got my list of pitchers that I that I like late. Um, I don't. 
it's not a position I trust a great deal. Um, I, we, we're also in an era where nobody pitches a lot of innings, right? So the impact of any individual pitcher, I feel like, is a little bit, I don't know, it's a little bit uh, uh, lessened. Um, so this, this has been pretty common for me. The one thing that I, I will say I'm, I'm pretty upset with is uh, I don't, like, I have a lot of batting average downside on this team. And normally I wouldn't do that to myself, right? The, one of the points of, of drafting, you know, nothing but but elite bats early is to not have any offensive weaknesses. And I, I feel like I might have one. Um, so that's a that's a worry. But but some of that is simply the fact that I can't resist Kyle Schwarber when he's when he's up next in queue. Kyle Schwarber on your team, Cody Bellinger on your team, Ozzie Albies, Bobby Witt was your first pick, Raphael Devers right after that. Also have George Springer, uh, TJ Friedel. Now uh, your latest pick, Andy. Yeah, the other the other thing I try to I, I try to accomplish is, and again, like Schwarber's an exception here, um, Devers is an exception here, but I want, I mean, I want steals with basically every position. It's pretty hmm. it's pretty unusual for me to get two guys who I don't think are going to steal any bases, but everybody else on this roster should be good for you know, 15 to 45. Right. And, and that's one of the benefits of taking somebody like Bobby Witt in the first is that you feel like that accounts for the, the necessary steals from at least two players. Right. So that's a, that, that's a good way to begin. I, this is the first share of Bobby Witt that I've actually gotten. Um, and, Mm. and some of that is just that I have Corbin Carroll, like one spot above him in the ranks. And so that's generally where I go if I have an early pick. Um, but I'm happy, happy to do it. Um, this is a, this was a pretty, um, you know, I, if I could map out the first three rounds of pretty much any draft, it would it would go a lot like this. And I would get one of those top five guys with speed and I'd get Albie somewhere along the line and I'd, I'd fill third base with one of the elite options. So I like the way that opened. Um, I will say the the one time I got um, I really got sniped in this was um, I really like Yamamoto. And I mm-hmm. he's the he's the one pitcher where I'll allow for a little bit of an indulgence and I'll and I'll dip down and I'll, I'll grab a pitcher pitcher early. Um, I, I think that guy has a chance to be the number one overall. So he was fourth round. You would have taken him instead of Cody Bellinger if he was still there for you in the fourth round. Yeah, I had it queued up and it's really like, I feel like it's my rank on Yamamoto that has him pushed up so high in the, in the, in the Yahoo um, pre-draft sure. ranks. So that's, so that's on me. I should have, I should have buried him a little bit more. I should have probably ranked him as like my SP 12 or something the like that. Strategy the strategy within the strategy here. Uh, DJ, uh, Andy couldn't take Cor- Corbin Carroll because you took Corbin Carroll with the number three overall pick. Then you took Pete Alonso, Bo Bichette. Uh, you got Bobby Miller, so you started to fill out your starting pitching in round number four with Tyler Glass now, and then the reliever in Emmanuel Classe. Your strategy so far, what you set out to do, and what you've been able to accomplish so far, DJ. Well, I knew, you know, I would probably get Julio Rodriguez or Corbin Carroll would be sitting there for me, so I was happy to get either of those guys. Uh, Alonzo just wanted the power upside after getting Carroll in the first round. Um, and then after that, I kind of wanted to offset the batting average risk with Alonzo uh, and get Bo Bichette there. I was kind of debating between Bichette uh, and Francisco Lindor, both shortstops. But again, Lindor, you know, probably 250, 260 is what you're hoping for there. So I was happy to get Bo Bichette there, but not as active on the, on the base paths as you, as you would like. So I had to supplement that a bit later with some of my other picks. You know, in this kind of world where Spencer Strider is the clear number one starter, we don't know what's going on with Garrett Cole. I'm kind of just like the starting pitching. It's like smoke them if you've got them. And that's kind of like what the Dodgers are doing. You know, Bobby Miller, Tyler Glass down. That's how I'm starting my rotation in this league. You know, will Glass now throw 120 innings this year? Who knows? How many innings can Bobby Miller throw in his first full season? Who knows? But I have I have a pretty good guess that when they're on the mound, they're going to deliver elite numbers. So that's where I'm going with my with my rotation. Hey, DJ, what do you think, you know, outside of, of pitching and maybe some advantages there, where are the advantages this year for people who are watching? And, you know, steals was a big topic last year because we thought there was going to be an increase of them. And Andy already says you got to have, you know, maybe steals with every uh, positional player that you take. What, what do you think some of the cheat codes are potentially this year? Yeah, I, I, I think waiting on pitching is fine. I, I would, I feel like it for a few years, starting pitchers hopped up to the first few rounds so many. But this year, I really think you can wait because especially if Garrett Cole, let's let's hope it's not a serious injury. But if he's out for a while, like who could be the number two fantasy starter this year? Maybe it's Yamamoto, but it could be 
it could be Scooble, you know, it could be anyone. Like we, we really don't know. So I think it's important to attack that hitting really early. And I think you can get a lot of good quality starting pitching fifth, sixth, seventh round, hit it there, and you'll probably still be in good shape. Uh, and I, Eric. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, you can hit it there and then wait for a while. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I'm looking right now, and obviously our league is set up differently, but I, I now that I have my core of Wheeler, Peralta, Musgrove, and Darvish, who I feel really strong about, like the mix of upside and, <clears throat> and just consistency there, I have just a, uh, a, so many guys in my queue who are total upside shots that I love taking, especially in a 12-team format where I love taking upside um, starters outside of my main rotation because I think <clears throat> there's just more pitching on the wire. And so I'm happy to take guys who might explode out of the gate. And then if I, you know, let's say I hit on 50% of my dart throws at the end of drafts. Well, I'm getting some real good upside there. And then I can change the guys who didn't hit for whatever bat, you know, looks good in the first couple of weeks. And I didn't have to play, uh, you know, use massive amounts of fab to get that starting pitcher who had 10 strikeouts on opening day because that guy always goes for so much money. You see somebody come out of the gate and have a huge first start. Um, and they kind of like fly off the board. I'd rather take some of these guys here. So I, I probably won't take starting pitching for a little bit and I'll see which of those guys fall um, and, you know, try to get some guys I'm really interested in who are going late in drafts. You know, I think that's a really good point, especially in a shallower type of league, like attack the sure things. And I'd say try to get two closers you feel really good about early. You know what I mean? So you've got that secured in a shallow league. You don't have to be you know, diving into the waiver wire to figure out who's going to be the next closer. At least you feel assured about that. But yes, I think at a shallow league, you can afford to take a few more risks. You could draft a Wyatt Langford. You can draft a Jackson Churio because the replacement level value is so high on the waiver wire. You could afford to take some more risks and more chances during the draft if you want. So we've seen three catchers go off the board here in round number 14. DJ, you took the third of those in, in Sean Murphy. Seems yeah. to be catcher the catcher round 14, at least in this draft. Yeah, we're, we're getting to the wave here. You know, Murphy got off to an awesome start last year with the Braves. Basically, you know, Acuna, yes, he won the MVP. But if you look at the first half Sean Murphy had last year, it was incredible. Um, he got hurt around midseason. I can't help but think that had some impact on the way he played during the second half. So, you know, a full offseason to recover from that. It's still a stacked lineup there in Atlanta. I wanted Francisco Alvarez, but of course, uh, Connor Rogers, fellow Mets fan, took him from me. Uh, so, Sean, you know, I feel good about Sean Murphy. You know, I don't have to worry about the catcher position. He'll be fine. Uh, Eric, you're on the clock here. Cedric Mullins you took with the 14th round pick. Yeah, I think, you know, you're talking about Cedric Mullins now getting closer to pick 200. Um, and this is not like, you know, third round Cedric Mullins that we saw before. But I still think he is, they don't really have anybody else who can play center field in Baltimore. All of their prospects um, are corner outfield guys. So I think that there's some safety in Cedric Mullins in terms of um, playing time. I think you're going to get a decent amount of speed from him. I do think, um, you know, there's something to him not being 100% last year and the swing changes like, he was hitting a lot of infield fly balls. His launch angle went crazy high, a lot of pop-ups, which led to a poor batting average. So I think I'm expecting less power from Mullins this year, but I think we see a better batting average than last year and still 20-plus steals. Um, and I'm just filling out kind of like the rest of my roster now where I just felt like having a little bit of extra speed on on my bench was important. And then I took Logan Ohapi as my catcher just because, as I mentioned, wow. Um, I just think there's a lot of starting pitching value later. Um, I got scooped on a lot of the relievers I was waiting for. And so I'm just going to take a, um, it's not how I would ideally like to, to play relievers here. Like DJ said, I'd like to have two guys I feel good about. Um, but I'm going to just, you know, take some dart throws later rather than reach sure. on a reliever here. And so I really like Logan Ohapi. Um, and so I'm happy to get him as my starting catcher in a one catcher format. Andy, you've made a couple of picks here in the last couple of rounds that we haven't talked about. Robert Suarez, Tyro Estrada from the uh, Giants, a guy that will play everywhere and get some steals. I'll give you free reign to talk about any player that you see on the board here that, that stands out to you over, over the last couple of rounds or perhaps the guys that you just took. Yeah, um, Estrada, especially in a format like this, like we have very limited bench spots here and, and almost anybody that you can get 
on the bench who qualifies at multiple positions. You can you can slot them in in a couple of different ways and somebody who gives you a few steals, a little bit of power. Um, I like something like that on my bench. Um, I'll probably only have one hitter. Again, I think we have like three bench spots in this in this format. So I'll probably only have one hitter there, a couple of pitchers. Um, and it was going to have to be a multi-position guy. I think that's really mm -hmm. important here and, and just something that you everybody needs to think about when they're when they're dealing with a short bench league. Mm -hmm. The Giants Andy, Andy, lineup should Andy. be better this season, too. You look at the names they added this offseason, Jorge Soler, Matt Chapman recently as well. That's a pretty mm -hmm. decent lineup out there in San Francisco. And he he was playing really well, and then he got hurt in the middle of the year. And the, the stats, mm -hmm. um, you know, they didn't fully nosedive, but they declined a little bit. So I'm expecting a better year from Estrada than he had last year. I, I think that he's uh, pretty undervalued, and it was a, a really solid pick. <laughs> Andy, anyone else that you're seeing here the last couple of rounds? I mean, as a Detroit Tiger fan, Spencer Torkelson, I think he's going to have a monster year, but uh, that's maybe wishful wishful thinking. But uh, yeah, anyone else that you might be targeting later in drafts or at this point in drafts? Yeah, it, it's interesting. Torkelson is a guy that I was looking at, but again, I've already like I, I've I've already got a couple of guys <laughs> who are not going to steal any bases, and you can only indulge so much in that in that profile, right? So um, I didn't ultimately go there, but I was looking at him pretty hard. Um, I will, I will say there's a pitcher I'm, a, I'm hoping I'm, I'm going to be able to take. Cause again, I have my list of starting pitchers where like, you, yeah. it's important to keep a list. If you don't like the guys who go early, uh, or mm -hmm. you don't intend to take a pitcher early, you got to have a list of late options. Um, Tr Tristan McKenzie, it, like sits out there until the very last rounds in most drafts. Like he's usually somebody you can get in like the 20th round. I'm probably not going to do that here, but man, that guy was an ace just a couple of years ago and he looks fine in spring. He's not reporting any issues. So that's probably somebody I'm targeting pretty soon. So now code of honor, Eric and DJ cannot draft. They cannot. McKenzie. No, well, like I'll, be, I'll be after him. So, you know, definitely if, wasn't if, up if at that point at all. If at that point, if Andy passes, then it's fair game, you know. <laughs> um, I did. Uh, I did just want to point out, um, you know, Key Brian Hayes just went um, to Scott in the last round. Um, I I really like Key Brian Hayes this year. I think people have been waiting for a swing change for him that we actually saw from August on last year when he get, when he came back from being hurt. He had career high pull rates, career high fly ball rates. Hit ten home runs in forty nine games to end the season. Um, is hitting the ball really well in the spring right now. So I don't think you're going to have like you know twenty five home run seasons from Key Brian Hayes, but I. I, it's not crazy to me if he pushes 20 home runs while also stealing 15 bases at third base. And he has always put up really usable batting average totals. Um, so that's somebody where like if I am waiting on third base, because especially if you draft in deeper formats, you really have to have one position where you kind of wait. You can't, you know, in a 15 team league, you can't fill everything. Um, Key Ryan Hayes and Michael Garcia at third base, I think, are really great targets who are going later. Um, and so I loved that pick and I love the Edward Julian pick that, that Howard Bender just took. I think, you know, he's in for a really good season mm -hmm. at the top of the twins lineup in the strong side platoon for them. You know, to your, to your point, third base is, is like one of the, it's basically third base and catcher where you really can't find very many steals. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, that is something that Hayes offers and it's not available in abundance at third. Yeah, and I love that. That's why we talk about like Freddie Freeman and Bryce Harper at, at first base, right? The idea mm -hmm. that you, it's not just how many total steals am I getting? It's where do you maybe have an advantage on the rest of the field in steals? And so if your first baseman steals way more bases than the normal first baseman, then you are able to kind of give yourself a little bit of a head start, um, provided you don't just like do nothing for the whole rest of the, the time. <laughs> All right, Andy, you felt like you had to take him here now because you talked about him, Tristan McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, I was pretty well <laughs> obligated to take him right there. I mean, again, like this, it's possible that this doesn't work out and it's possible that the elbow issues come back. Um, but man, he was so good just two years ago. He's still a young player. And again, he's reporting no health issues right now. Just looked good in a in a spring outing. So uh, I'll take a shot there with a guy who has maintained low ratios and has struck out a batter per inning. All right, DJ, your last pick as a uh, part of the broadcast. So I'm going to go with someone who's looked really good this spring. That's Starling Marte um, with the Mets. You know, if he can look at come his, back. Look at his last two picks, this homer over here on the <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know, I, I needed some runs scored. I'm looking. See, I, as the course of a Yahoo draft, I, I start looking at the standings board and getting super paranoid. So I needed some runs scored. Brendan Nimmo at the top of the Mets lineup. He's got to get on base. He's going to score some runs. But Starling Marte, seriously, I'm looking for speed late in this draft because – 
you know, I did draft some guys who are a little bit one dimensional, Yanni Diaz, guys like that. Uh, so I wanted this to supplement my roster with speed and Marte's look good this spring. Uh, I think if healthy, he could still be a really good fantasy outfielder. So to get him this late when a couple of years ago, he was a top 50 pick, you know, I'll take a chance on that. Guys, thank you. Thanks for uh, participating in the draft again. Thanks for coming on and talking to us. Thanks for the style, Andy, again. Thanks, thanks for it all, <laughs> basically. Uh, good luck the rest of the way, guys. Thanks, Ahmed. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. All right, Andy Barron's DJ Short, the very own DJ Short from Roto World. Uh, before we welcome in our last two guest pickers, our experts, let's tell you about the Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. You know that already you're watching this program this is going to help you also the roto world draft guide will help you it's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings projections player profiles to ensure your draft is a success you can visit nbcsports.com slash draft guide use baseball 24 to get 10 percent off at checkout and now as we wind down the draft we welcome in george bissell from roto world himself and jen piacenti from sports illustrated eric go ahead George has sniped me so many times in this mock draft, including right now on Mason Miller, um, and oh. it's infuriating me. And it's Did the reason why I have no closers right now. Uh, he was in my queue too. I know. I, I think <laughs> Mason Miller is being wholly underrated, and people are concerned that they said he's not the closer at the start of spring training. But to me, that's actually better for him because I think he's going to um, – I think that he's going to, as I make this last pick, which I don't love, but we're just going to do it right now. Um, I think that Mason Miller is going to start off um, in a multi-inning role, and he's going to pitch two to three innings at a time, and he's going to get lots of strikeouts, and then I think he will emerge as the closer midway through the year. I still think he could get 15 saves in the season on that team while picking up you know, wins and strikeouts. Um, I, I love Mason Miller. Um, I really wanted to get him. I went with Hunter Harvey instead, who I was hope I would have taken probably way, you know, two, three rounds later, but um, I need a reliever. And I think Harvey looked really good at the end of last year. I think he's probably going to be the guy in Washington. Um, and so, you know, he's always somebody who couldn't stay healthy, but had lots of upside. And so I'm, I'm hoping for a healthy 20 save season on a mediocre Washington nationals team. So, Jen, we'll break down your team here in just a second. So, George, how do you okay. respond to that as, as, a, as a sniper? Well, I can say is great minds think alike, Eric. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of my plan here. Um, no, I, I, I like Miller, too. I think the path is clear for him where if they've decided he's not going to be a starting pitcher, the way to maximize his value is by moving him to closer and maybe getting the most out of him there. So definitely going to pitch in high leverage, and I'd assume he takes over that job pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. All right, Jen, uh, let's look at your team from the from the yeah. get-go here. You got Julio Rodriguez, you got Luis Robert, so you got outfield, outfield, your first two picks. You went Jose yeah. Altuve, and then you went pitching with Pablo Lopez, Logan Webb, Jazz Chisholm filling out your uh, outfield, Zach Eflin, then Alex Bregman after that. Now you've filled out some depth uh, in other positions since then. How, how do you like the draft so far? Has it gone the way you wanted it to go? Would have been some surprises. Just uh, fill us in, Jen. I like it. Uh, it's gone the way I expected it to go, essentially. I was a little surprised that J-Rod was there for me at pick four, but hey, and Bobby Witt was there too. So I wasn't expecting to have that nice of a choice even. So it was wonderful. Um, I decided to go with J-Rod simply because, I don't know. I just, I've, I haven't had him. I haven't had him on in my fantasy teams before. And I've had Bobby Witt and he's been awesome, but you know, sometimes you just have to diversify. So um, yeah, I liked it. I planned to take a pitcher in round four and I planned to take Pablo Lopez and that went exactly as planned. So I like that. I also appreciate that we get to be on in this last segment because this is where I get to basically just pick all my favorite sleepers yes. and just have fun, like, and just this talk about the, the potential. Yeah. This is the have fun yeah. portion of the draft. Um, and I Absolutely. love it. Uh, and this is why, you know, I talked earlier, this is why I mm -hmm. like to wait on starting pitching because the have fun part yep. of the draft right now to me is littered with starting pitchers that I think have a very wide range of outcomes. But if you're just thinking about the potential um, best outcome, uh, there are just some guys here that I think have really interesting upside. 
Well, absolutely. If you think about pitchers that went after pick 250 last year or picked up on the waiver wire, you've got Justin Steele, Cole Reagans. I mean, like it's it's endless. Uh, Eduardo Rodriguez, like so. And I had like Grayson Rodriguez, Yuri, Yuri Perez. They were all, you know, my first place teams. I had two or three of these pitchers. So like the the need to like jump on starting pitching, I just don't feel it. I feel like round four, mm -hmm. round five is right and then there's a bunch of them right there so the offense is so loaded and with the explosion of steals this year i feel like you can't avoid those power speed combos in the early rounds and build a solid team we'll see how that theory works out but that's how i'm building this year so i'll want to focus on a lot of these guys that are going off the board but first george i think the way you started the draft was was fascinating you took spencer strider with the second overall pick then you took ellie de la cruz Corey Seager, you were the first to take a catcher in Adley Rutschman. You took Mike Trout in the fifth round, and then you took Cole Reagans, aforementioned uh, out of the Royals, the up-and-coming starting pitcher here. So take me through the top of your draft and your strategy there. Is it not the most fun team ever assembled? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, widest, the widest possible range of outcomes. Yes. I think the Strider pick stands out, and it's been touched on a couple times in this uh in this draft so far but i think the gap between strider and the rest of the starting pitching pool with the uncertainty surrounding garrett cole where uh even if it, he's going to pitch this season he's going to miss some time at the outset of the year so i just think the gap between him and the rest of the starting pitching pool is to the point where i felt like it was worth it to take the risk and why not I, he's looked phenomenal this spring especially with the addition of the curveball the impact that's going to have against left-handed batters like that could be huge. So there's actually even more strikeout upside if you can believe that with him. So I like the start of that draft. And then sort of the, the picks, like the Mike Trout pick, that was sort of, while well, risky, you know, you're looking at sort of high floor outcome uh, type of guys with that Corey Seager and Adley Rushman uh, to try and make up some of the ground there uh, where you, we're not taking a hitter in the first round. I really like the Trout pick because I, I think, you know, the narrative on him is so focused on the injuries um, and that's fair, but it it also overshadows just how good of a hitter he remains. And I know you're not getting the speed that you used to get um, when he was younger, but this is still a guy who's going to produce when he's on the field. And remember, without without Otani in L.A. now, or he's in L.A., without Otani on the <laughs> Angels, um, there's a chance that they let Mike Trout DH a little bit more than he had in the past, whether he's open to that or not. But that could help. You know, Obviously, that won't do anything for the, the hand issues that he suffered in the past, but it could just do something to the general wear and tear. Um, and maybe you do get 120, 130 games out of Mike Trout, and, and there's still a lot of value there. Yeah, so the elephant in the room is obviously Ellie De La Cruz. Like, if he reaches his ceiling or even comes close to that, uh, this team's going to be pretty good, especially if Strider pitches well and stays healthy. So, Jen, you have just taken Jorge Polanco. Was he one of those that you have on your list to take in the later rounds? Absolutely. You know, I know that the knock on Jorge Polanco is we haven't really seen him be that healthy, but even in 80 games played last season, he got you what 14 home runs. He was in like the 88th percentile and barrel rate. He was in the 92nd percentile and sweet spot. Like I love these, you know, baseball savant stats. Um, and he's going to play every day. He's going to play third right behind my guy, Julio, that I just drafted, right? So I'm kind of like in on the Mariners offense and apparently also in on the Astros offense. So go AL West. Um, didn't plan that, but it is what it is. Right, and I can move him around like second, third, probably for eligibility, depending, especially in Yahoo, because they're fairly generous with the eligibility. Um, and that's the same reason that I took Henry Davis, uh, the previous pick. He has just been raking all spring. I mean, four home runs. Uh, he went to driveline in the off season. His swing path is gorgeous. Uh, just to watch him hit a baseball is beautiful. He has 20 home run upside, possibly 10 steals. And he has eligibility probably very soon at catcher like hello. And he's going in the last pick of your draft. So uh, these are the guys, these are the fun guys. Like, you know what, if I miss, who cares? I'll pick up somebody on the waiver wire, but the potential I see is really exciting. And these are my favorite picks of the draft. All right, Eric, how about your last two picks here? Yeah. Um, so I went with Robert Stevenson. Uh, we mentioned that I was going to have to take some dart throws um, on closers because again, just it's George's fault basically. Um, Robert Stevenson was the big signing for the Angels in the offseason. He looked great um, with the Rays because, you know, what the Rays do, they take people with 
good raw stuff who haven't produced uh, and teach them how to throw their best. Um, and so, you know, he's a 30 year old coming off his best year. He is, uh, they say he's going to be ready for opening day. Um, he was in a battle with Carlos Estevez to be the closer. Um, I think they're both going to share that job to start the year because obviously Robert Stevenson hasn't pitched in the spring. So it's going to be, he's going to be slow on the upstart, but I think he takes that job. Um, I think he's just a really talented overall reliever. So I liked getting him at my final relief pitching spot. And then, you know, we're filling out our final two spots on this team right now. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, this is a short bench league. I might have gone for bats um, at this point, but I want my bench to be mostly starting pitchers with huge upside because um, I want to see if it clicks early on. There has been almost nobody better in the spring than AJ Puck. He was a top tier yeah. prospect for the athletics before being traded to the Marlins and, and being a, a reliever for them last year. He looks great. Um, he's made some changes to the pitch mix so that he could uh, last longer in games. And so, you know, I really like him as a last round pick. And I also really like the two pitchers that George and Jen just took. They were both on my list of, of possible options here in the last round. So I'd love to hear, uh, I guess, George, since you went first, if you want to talk about your your pitcher and then Jen afterwards, why, why you went with this route. Yeah, so Fadi, he changed everything kind of he did overseas in Korea. Um, he's had... He hasn't had a great spring. I think he's had some issues with like gripping the baseball, things like that. It's because it's a different ball that they use in the major leagues than overseas. So uh, assuming he can kind of get that squared away, I think he's actually really interesting because we've seen some guys have success overseas and then have it translate back to the majors. And then Kodai Senga is the other one where, yeah, obviously he's going to be out until at least mid-May. But barring any setbacks, which shoulder issues are tricky, uh, he comes back and easily is a pretty impactful starter. So I, I tell you, I like the injury discount with him right now uh, in most drafts. So those are two guys I kind of hit on. And you know, some of the other guys I like too. I, I took Kyle Harrison a couple rounds ago. He's a guy I really like. He's having a good spring um, for the Giants. Added a new pitch. Has looked really good so far. So yeah, those are a couple of the guys I've liked. Yeah, Jen, I had Edward Cabrera last year. He was awesome and when he was <laughs> awesome. And exactly. when he was not, it was not great. <laughs> exactly. I think he had like 5.98 walks per nine last season, bottom 1% of the league. Not good, right? But when he's on, oh my gosh, he's so filthy. It's like so amazing. So he's looked good in spring, right? Um, he has been controlling his only two walks so far this spring. It looks like he's got his command. For me, there's just nothing to lose in taking that upside shot for Cabrera because, you know, the potential is so sky high. And as I said, at this point in the draft, that's what I'm just looking for. I also like AJ Puck for the same reasons. I just uh, released a sleeper, sleeper pitcher article today on Sports Illustrated and Cabrera and Puck mm -hmm. and Cutter Crawford are all on that list. So um, I think there's a lot of value, including this guy that maybe I'm about to draw, draft next, maybe if it makes it back to me uh, for late pitchers this year. And just as an update, because uh, Jen did talk about Edward Cabrera, um, I know everybody knows he was scratched from his start on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, all the testing on him, the strength testing, has come back positive. He said he feels great. The Marlins yeah. sent him for an MRI just to confirm that things are moving in the right direction. Um, he was only scratched three days ago as we're recording this. So if everything does check out, you're talking about a guy who was out for five to six days. There's really no reason why he couldn't start the season in the rotation. Um, so if you're getting a discount in drafts because people think he's going to be out, um, obviously, you know, we're recording this on Tuesday. So keep track of any latest news. But he seems to be trending to be ready for the start of the year. Um, so he's a great pick at the end of drafts right now. All right, so uh, as we, we near the end of our draft here, George, were you about to chime in there? No, sorry. <laughs> I, oh, no, I was no, actually you, just going to say uh, oh, Roto Pat right just took uh, Sedani Raffaella, um, who just hit a two-run homer uh, right now. Um, and uh, what we saw today from the Red Sox is they're starting Tyler O'Neill in right field for the first time all spring. Um, and they're starting Duran in left field so they can start Raffaella in center field. Um, Rafaela is a potential gold glove center fielder. Jaron Duran is not a wow. good defensive center fielder. Um, if Rafaela keeps hitting, there's a very good chance that he breaks camp as the Red Sox starting center fielder with Duran um, in left field, um, Tyler O'Neill and William Abreu kind of splitting time in right field. So Duran is a last round pick here um, from Roto Pat was great because he does have power speed upside um, and maybe like 15 homer power in the major leagues, but that's not nothing. 
Um, and so I, I really, I really like that pick from Pat. Jen, I assume Luis Severino was the player you were targeting. He is the player I was targeting. Um, I like his move over to Queens. Uh, I under, like, look, last year, last year was a disaster. There's no question about it. It was a disaster in spring. It was a disaster all year. But he's looked good in spring, and there was talk maybe he was tipping some pitches. So, you know, I'm in, like, again, what do you have to lose? We know what Severino is capable of. And, and I have this certain way that I approach drafting Yankees. Like, for instance, I'm probably lower than most on Juan Soto this year because I lived in New York, and I just feel like, the microscope some players are under. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. I feel like Severino will be okay staying in New York. I think Queens is a safer place for him. I think he's going to be okay, at least be usable in fantasy. I'm concerned about once. I know he's looked good in spring, but I'm still concerned. I'm concerned, and I, I think everyone thinks because he's a lefty. Uh, but in reality, like a lot of the home runs he hit, they still wouldn't have gone out in Yankee Stadium last year. So we'll see. I mean, yeah. upside's huge for Soto, but I'm not – I'm not betting on his MVP futures. All right, so we are on to our last pick, Will Benson, a giant human being, taken by George with his last pick. <laughs> yeah, uh, the thing I like about Benson is he has contact issues, but he kind of checks all the boxes if you're looking for a high upside fantasy contributor. He's got a little sure. power. He can steal bases. So just a marginal uptick in contact would lead to some increased playing time and I got to say, I, Eric took the Jared Jones there at the end. That's my favorite pick of the draft. I, I ran out of pitcher slots last yeah. round, so he, he would have been my next guy on my list. So That's, that's why I said I, I still have guys like Mackenzie Gore, Reese Olsen, who I yeah. tweeted about today, so I felt like I was almost contractually obligated to take him in this draft. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Jared Jones – there's a chance he doesn't break camp with the Pirates. Um, he's looked great this spring. I think he's going to be up before Paul Skeens. He has more innings at the higher levels of the minors. He's already still in camp. Paul Skeens has already um, been told he won't break camp. Um, and so these are the types of picks I like taking at the end of 12-team leagues. I want to know early on with my bench pitchers if I should carry them or not. Um, that's why I like even, you know, Severino is not a prospect, but I think Jen's pick of Severino is following the same logic, which is like, if he has his stuff from two years ago, you'll know in the first start or two, right. if he looks like the Severino of last year, you'll know. And those are guys you can, you can move on from quickly. And I like, I like doing that because it, <laughs> it, now it allows me to have a potential ace in the hole on my bench. And if it doesn't work, then I'll swap for somebody who looks good at the start of the year. And that's why, like I said, I like having those be pitchers because you can make that decision quicker. You don't really want to cut a, a hitter after like four or five bad games. What, what does that mean? That's nothing. That's not a lot of at bats, but with a pitcher, in particular, I, I want to just I want to watch that pitcher the first start, even if I have to watch on delay, because if I'm going to make a decision on one start, I want to see more than the box score. What did the velocity look like? What did the movement look like? Was it a lot of getting ahead early? Was it a lot of three two counts where everything was a struggle? You know, that can help me make a decision and say, I'm just going to move on. I didn't like anything about this. Hey, that hitter has three home runs in the first six games. I'll make this swap and, and hope that that is something that can stick. Right. So Jen and George, the, the, the fact that you guys are here at the end, you get the luxury of kind of breaking this whole thing down. And I don't know if you've closed out your draft application yet. Hopefully not. Uh, maybe biggest surprises, biggest things, biggest trends you saw, biggest, uh, uh, the best pick that you saw. Any, anything you want to talk about of what we just witnessed here for the last hour and a half uh, within this draft, your favorite pick, whatever it may be, Jen, I'll, I'll give you the floor to, to start things out. I guess the the biggest thing I noticed is I actually want to like commend George for his pick of the bold pick of Spencer Strider because you're right with the Garrett Cole news that is like the ultimate zag if everybody else is going to zig because the trend is now to wait on starting pitching and if we're all wrong which is entirely possible then you're going to end up with the best pick of round one. And I think that's really interesting. And I think that's a very valid strategy. So we're all writing articles saying you got to be concerned about steals and be sure you get your speed because it's up across the league. But in reality, again, especially with that Garrett Cole news, there is a big chasm between one and two. And that, that could be a really interesting strategy. So I think that's the thing that stood out the most to me. There you go, George. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jen. Uh, sometimes genius has to walk alone, and sometimes you're wrong. So if, if it doesn't go well, uh, you'll know what went wrong. Uh, yeah, I, I just 
we found out the draft order last night and I spent a good, you know, 12 hours thinking about this and wow. The safe play would have been to go with Julio Rodriguez. That's probably who I would have gone with 99 times out of a hundred. But when you look at the uncertainty with the pitching landscape and all pitchers are injury risks, but with the gap between Strider and the rest of the starting pitcher pool, it just felt like sort of the right play. I also thought about Mookie Betts as well. Now with the shortstop mm-hmm. eligibility, like to have a player who's that good eligible at so many spots, it gives you so much flexibility in the season. So that would have been probably my second choice. Uh, but I, I just felt like the Strider thing was, you know, go big or go home. Like, let's do this. Let's see what happens. So, Eric, will will Georgia's team finish? Is it more likely to finish first or last? What would you what would you put the percentages there? Um, out of spite, I want to say last, just because of <laughs> uh, how mad I am at him. But no, I, I think it. I think um, you know, it's a, a lot needs to go right between the injuries and and the upside. But again, like you know we're supposed to have a little bit of fun here. I'm sure if George right. is, is playing in a league where he's got lots of lots of money on the line, he might not be making the same picks. And that's why it's really important to know your league and know your format is, you know, what type of, are you in a league where you can take that, that kind of upside gamble? Um, and so, you know, George in a 12 team league with a shallower roster is set up perfectly to, to make those kind of risks. And that was also my big takeaway in general too, is like, Relief pitching went a little earlier than I'm used to seeing, and I think that's, again, the nature of, okay, we have fewer hitting spots, so we need fewer hitters, so pitchers in general were being pushed up, Um, and so that also included relievers, and so that was, it took me a little bit to adjust to that draft, and I'll blame the fact that I was also on the show the whole time where I didn't really (laughs) pick up on that trend immediately, but I think that's an important lesson for everybody, too, is one, go into the draft really knowing your format and knowing how your format might differ from the formats of like ADP or other drafts you've done. And then also read the room, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, don't have full conversations with people in the middle of drafting. And it takes you forever to realize that like, oh, relief pitchers are going early. So you need to then make a conscious decision. Do you want to then take one? And do you want to like adjust your strategy to to join what people are doing? Or do you want to adjust your strategy to say, okay, I will take what's falling, but understand that by doing so, you need to have a really clear plan of how to make up the relief pitching or the steals or whatever it is that's being pushed up. If you don't want to push that category up, how do I then get that category later in my drafts if I've taken value that's falling earlier on? Well, I will say, Eric, that maybe midway through the draft, I started asking more of the questions to our guests. And so I think you were more locked in in that part of the draft. And so if there's a mistake I, there that you regret, that's all on you. That wasn't the I co-hosting. Was, I was being a, a good listener. You know, I was trying to be <laughs> locked in on what they were saying and take yeah. the wisdom. But well, yeah, no, it's uh, it all. And, and listen, it happens really quickly. You know, um, I think that's something that that, you know, sometimes we take for granted is it's it is hard especially as people get more used to like oh i'm using this software as i draft i have my rankings i want to mark down what other people are doing i have an adp sheet i look at i have twitter open to make sure that my pitcher didn't blow out his elbow before i pick him like all of these things it's a lot to you know to process when you have a minute to pick and so really making sure of what your setup is and making sure that every you feel like you have a good handle on everything when you're in your draft can help you to make sure you don't kind of get underwater a little bit as things start to speed up. All right, I that's have a it. Of, we have done oh, it. Yes, sorry. Jen. Oh, I'm sorry. I no, say, I will, Jen, you get the last yeah. word. <laughs> no, well, since you were giving such sage advice about general drafting, I just wanted to say a couple things too about like how I draft and maybe like some advice for going in and For instance, like we're going to get a draft grade after this and it's going to say that we get C's or A's or B's or Evan. First of all, throw that out um, because obviously Andy Barron's and Scott are going to be tops because they did the ranking. I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) Come with come with your rankings and your guys and they're going to be different than necessarily what those people think and stick with it because you're going to have way more fun if it's your guys. And the other thing is you do need to watch for trends like, oh, are the relief pitchers going fast and things like that and have it a plan to pivot to. I agree. But at the same time, I find sometimes people spend so much time watching everybody else's team. And I watch fantasy experts do this all the time. They don't pay attention to their team. I know that sounds crazy, but you start looking, you just, you know, 
you don't realize like, well, maybe I don't have a second baseman or a third baseman right now. I should start looking for who's the best second baseman or third baseman, not who's the best overall or who's, who's doing this run. Just look at your team, make your team as beautiful as you can. And then in the end, you're going to enjoy your team and probably your team's going to be a winner. So yeah, be aware of general twin trends, but I think sometimes people get overly involved with marking down every move and this and who has that and I have to block them like to an extent, build your beautiful team because you have to play this for a really, really, really long time and you need to like your team. You gotta like your team. I like that advice. Uh, George, is there any advice left to give after that? From, no, from I, have six, and, and I have a six month old puppy who's currently destroying my house. So <laughs> I'm gonna wrap Let's get George out of here. No. Let's get you guys out of here. Jen, yeah, George, really thank fun. you so much. Eric, Eric, great job uh, uh, driving the driving the car with me here today. Uh, that is the 2024 Roto World mock draft officially done.